Well, let's talk about theory a little bit. Uh, how do you describe your role as a theorist at P2P? Okay, so, you know, I, I think the, the important, um, there's a few things that I think are innovative in the way that we approach uh, theorizing. Um, first of all, we really do, do start from observing realities, right? So this is not like a, a political approach where you have a social ideal um, and you, you, know, you think how the world should be. It's, um, it's much more like we know what's wrong with the world, we know in what direction we should move. So let's see what people are doing to improve their situation and what's working and what's not working. So we're, we're very much first observing and documenting what is happening. And this is important because let's say we have a wrong theory, well, you can still use our documentation, right? So even if we're mistaken, our 18,000 articles are real initiatives, real people, real projects, real concepts being used by people in a working uh, environment. So this is very important. Um, and this is one thing. The second thing is that it's to a certain degree a collective effort. You know, I, I don't say this out of false modesty because I do have a, an important role in the community. Um, but so what I do is you know, from what I observe, trying to create a coherent framework, right? So everything we say has to be true and happen uh, for real. And everything we say has to be coherent, so not contradict each other. We can't say in one point, you know, the sky is blue, and then say the next one, the sky is purple, right? So there is a demand for coherence. But apart from that, it's pretty much like a Lego, you know, we're puzzling concepts together that are being used by people and we try to theorize on the basis of that. And it's done in continuing dialogue. So in, in, a, in a way, you know, I'm an individual, but the P2P Foundation is like a collective intellectual. It's a kind of a collective intelligence at work because there's many people involved in shaping these ideas and a third difference with you know the way we we may have done it in the past is we don't know how things should be and what needs to be done but what we want to create is have mutual alignment so it's making visible to people that there is a commonality in their action that you know they may think they're only doing their little garden you know their little urban gardening guerrilla gardening or vertical farming and somebody else may be doing an open source car, right? But what I'm what I'm trying to show them is that well, if you look at it, you're using the same principles of governance and of cooperation. And the fact that you have that in common that means something. It means you can learn from each other, and maybe you can reinforce uh, your separate endeavors by by coalescing, by aligning to each other, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so, so it, you know, we have this pragmatic uh, aim, right? We, we, we do want to change society, that's clear. You know, we, we're not saying that we're just objective. We are also object, subjective. We, we have certain values. Uh, on the other hand, and I, you know, it might be, seem a bit complex, but we're also pluralistic. So. What we say is, if you work with us, it means that you like peer-to-peer, -peer, that you think it's a good thing and an improvement if we have more peer-to-peer -peer in society. But we may disagree on how we exactly we get there, right? So the, we agree on producing a commons of knowledge, but we may not agree on the exact way that we get the ultimate aim, which is a more just uh, society. So, you know, we have conflicts, we have tensions, but it's a productive tension because we love the commons together, right? So this is why a left-wing free software activist in Latin America can work with a technocratic open source developer in Europe and a right-wing libertarian 
open source guy in the United States. The thing that binds them together is the love for the software that they like and are, and are constructing together. And so what, what that demands is that you put certain things on the brackets, right? Okay, we know we may disagree on this, but because we both love our commons, we, we cooperate in strengthening the commons. Mm -hmm. And your role, you said, is like a kind of librarian, even cataloging as this thing comes about. Yes, librarian, theoretician, and you know, facilitator, coordinator, networker. You know, and of course, I'm one of many. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is something that distinguishes the P2P Foundation from some others, which um, we do believe that P2P is destined to be the dominant social mode. Right? We think this is the new society, the new civilization. A lot of other people which are very interesting and I, I like their work like Jochai Benkler or Lawrence Lessig uh, or Dom Tapscott, they say yes, peer-to-peer -peer is there, it's just a subset of our capitalist market economy. Right? And we say yes, that's true now, but it actually has the potential to be a new mode of production, a new society that maybe not tomorrow but it has all the ingredients to create a sustainable society which today's capitalism doesn't have. Right? An infinite growth system is logically, physically, mathematically impossible in a finite planet. Mm -hmm. So this is a radical notion that we hold on to, that we need to fundamentally reorganize our society to make it sustainable. Mm -hmm. Another theorist in the same idea back in 70, 1776, Adam Smith wrote, of course, The Wealth of Nations. But there was another book that he wrote called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And um, right. his idea, the, uh, the capitalism and the free access to markets uh, was a kind of method or tool to achieve what he saw as a moral uh, society, uh, one that uh, freedom and equality or equality came about from free access to the market. So uh, a lot of the time when we're talking about capitalism, we're talking about something different than what he's talking about. Well, I, I think the important thing is that you know he assumed that the market would be embedded in this moral uh, society, right? And, it, and that's the problem that it doesn't. By itself, it doesn't. If you are in a for-profit company, you are legally obliged to maximize your profit and ignore externalities unless the, the society outside of you forces you, right? And basically now, this particular type of monopolistic market has eaten up everything and has started to dominate society. So what P2P wants is to re-embed market activities in an ethical economy. Mm -hmm. where the commons is at the core, this is where we share our knowledge, where we create our value as productive publics. Uh, then we have uh, foundations, non-profits, which manage the infrastructure of cooperation, like you have in open source software, the Apache Foundation, Linux Foundation, Wikimedia Foundation, right? And then you have entrepreneurs who create value on top of the commons without privatizing or enclosing the commons. So this is the model that we see operating on a micro scale and we want to to expand it to the whole of society. We want a society that works like an open source economy and that re-embeds the market uh, in an ethical framework and it's exactly you know the, when the Christians took over from the Romans, right, the, they had a similar problem. Power was disembedded from ethics and it has become a pure power system and the few revolution re-embedded power in, in a spiritual um, context. For example, that's why the Christian church forbade interest and usury, right? So they, they put limits and the problem now is that we've lost those limits and we have to re-establish those limits. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the what you're talking about introducing ethics back into it, it, of course, it just got taken out at one point because obviously Smith was talking about ethics you know, in the market and access to the market. Uh, 
say for example there in Thailand, a lot of people have difficulty accessing this global market, except maybe rice farmers trying to go through a major system which they have to go through the government because that's the only representation they have. Uh, P2P can help people, say, producing different kinds of products, maybe even farmers, to connect with each other and to, to create networks. So this, this exactly, because you know what happens in rice farming is a really good example, right? You have the rice farmers and they don't have, they don't have enough money, so uh, what they have to do is sell their rice at harvest time when it's, when it's very cheap. Uh, and they have to lend money to millets, right? And and so these intermediaries, they take 30% of the profit. And then the wholesalers who bring the rice to the Western countries take another 30%. Now both ends, both the producer and the retailer, they get a fraction, a marginal fraction of the, of the profit, right? So the people who create 90% of the value get 10% of the profit and are indebted and they can get out of it. So this is really a, a really good example of what's wrong with, um, with the system that we have now, right? And peer-to-peer -peer promises a much more direct contract between peers. Uh, like in fair trade, you know, what you do is you give a fair income to the producers, you, you minimize the intermediaries and then the end consumer pays a little bit more, you know, from an ethical point of view, because he wants to sustain the producers, right? So this is not exactly the same thing, but you you probably see that's part of the same movement, right? It it wants to create, it wants to subsume the market to an ethical framework. Let me uh, finish up with a final question. You just returned from Europe, so you've had quite a, an experience there. Uh, how has it? How has this movement grown in Europe? And you, as you watched it, because um, you've just been on a speaking tour, but you've been there before. Are you seeing growth? And well, yes. You know, of course, there is an overall um, crisis in Europe, as you know, right around the euro. And so I, th I think you, your, Europe is really in, in very dire straits because the, you know, the politicians. And the elite believe that the real productive economy and the people who work have to be sacrificed in order to maintain, you know, really speculative and predatory uh, financial system. Um, and so, basically, the, you know, the social contract with the youth is broken because what they're telling the youth of Europe is, you know. Education is going to be more and more expensive, so less and less of you are going to be able to, f to fund your education. Uh, and if you do, it's going to be through debt, your lifelong debt. Uh, you're, not, you're not going to be able to build a house. You know, you live to, with your parents until you're 35. Um, your pension is going to be uh, shrinking. Um, so I think that a growing number of young people are turning away from the mainstream system they're looking for solutions and so peer-to-peer -peer is part of these things that they're looking for and um, I've noticed that you know my, my work is really really popular in social entrepreneurships and co-working spaces right where young people get together to create 